It's amazing how time has flown so quickly throughout our series on this amazing book, the book of Acts, a book which we say, and Pastor Peter often repeats, is not over yet. Even if there are 28 chapters in the printed book of Acts, we know that it continues to be written even this day. And it's amazing, maybe someday in heaven there will be the completed book. I don't know how many chapters it will have, but Lord willing, some of our names might be mentioned there, and hopefully in a good way. <laughs> and uh, we'll, it's just so amazing to be part of God's work on earth. And as we review what has happened so far, I realize that the, our Truth Matters series, it, it runs like a TV series, right? I mean, it, you, you kind of leave behind what happened in the last episode, you're anticipating what will happen next, and sometimes there's a little bit of suspense. Okay, so if we were to treat it that way, let me now begin by saying, last week on Truth Matters. The last two verses of chapter 20, last week, it says, when he, Paul, had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul, and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. This was the ending of last week. And what we left behind was a heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching scene with the Ephesian elders, the Ephesian church leaders. And they were weeping and clinging onto Paul it was so hard to let him go, and it's so hard for Paul to let them go, because they knew without any shadow of a doubt that the next time they would see each other, it would be in heaven. Today's episode is in chapter 21, and we will be reading through the, only the first 14 verses. We will tackle the, next, the, the balance of chapter 21 next Sunday. And actually, last Sunday, today, and next Sunday, these are all leading up to our anniversary. And again, going back to the peg of a TV series or, or a, a series of books, this is like the rising action towards the climax in chapter 22, which will be tackled on our anniversary Sunday. So this is all leading up to that. And if you notice from last Sunday and even today and next Sunday, we'll, we'll be talking about Paul's intentionality and how that needs to rub off on you and on me. And so before we jump into Acts 21, verses 1 through 14, let me just ask you, what is one of the most common sayings people have about cats? Cats have, cats have what? Nine lives, that's correct. Now you and I know there's no such thing. But it's probably because uh, we observe that in most, if not all cases, no matter how high a height cats fall or jump from, they happen to land on their feet. Now of course cats don't have nine lives. But if there is a human being on this earth who seemed to have nine lives, it would have been the Apostle Paul. If you kind of review all of the things that he had gone through up to this point and the things that he still went through in pursuing God's purpose for his life, in living intentionally all for Christ, you would think he had nine lives. But the fact is, he only had one, which makes the point even more dramatic. Because just like you and just like me, Paul had only one life to live. So do you and so do I. And so the whole idea is really living our life fully, intentionally for Christ. Now just look at the laundry list of the things that Paul had to go through. Back-breaking work, imprisonment, beatings, 39 lashes beaten with rods, stoning, shipwreck, exposure. So he, he basically had to, do with, uh, had to live with the evil intents and actions of people. He also had to live with uh, the ravages by nature. He also had to endure things like dangers from Jews, Gentiles, robbers, dangers in the city, wilderness, sea, and rivers. He also had mental and emotional anguish, daily ministry pressures, sleepless nights, and he had physical infirmities too, hunger, thirst, and a thorn in the flesh. Now you and I, 
Lord willing, we may not need to go through everything the Apostle Paul went through. But for, for sure, you and I will have our fair share of trials and tribulations in this world. As a matter of fact, God's people are not exempt at all from challenges as we pursue God's purpose in our lives. Two of the greatest men of God in the Old Testament who actually appeared with Jesus in His transfiguration, they prayed a particular prayer at some point in their lives. Let me show you what they prayed. And you will exclaim, really? They prayed that? Have a look. Moses said, so if you are going to deal thus with me, please kill me at once. Have you heard people say that jokingly? Oh, kill me now. But that was their prayer. Kill me at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my wretchedness. Elijah, but he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. It's funny. The memory verse we read earlier says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. <laughs> but we're so glad, and I'm sure they were, that God did not grant their request. What moves people of God to pray something like that? You and I have had, have now, and will continue to have our own fair share of challenges even as we pursue God's purpose in our lives. What does that look like? This whole idea of living intentionally, of giving your life fully for Jesus. If we go back to the whole point of last Sunday, you and I need to examine our daily actions, where we spend our time, energy, and resources. Where does it go? Hopefully, our actions are aligned with our purpose. But most importantly, hopefully, our purpose is aligned with God's purpose. What you don't see in this diagram are the intervening trials, tribulations, challenges, disappointments, hurts, disturbances, doubts, distractions, and temptations you and I go through in our Christian life. Now, this is something that you and I should never be embarrassed to say. It should be our life testimony. I do believe that the overwhelming majority of the people in this room today, our desire is to pursue God's purpose for our life. Am I right? Well, let me put that to the test. If today, this morning, you can say, that's really my heart's desire. I want to know God. I want to pursue His purpose, His will for my life. That is my heart's desire. Will you raise your hand with me? Everybody in the room for whom that is true. Yes, fantastic. That's such an encouragement. At the same time, I want to ask this. If at any time in your pursuit of God's purpose for your life, if at any point in your Christian life to this day, you have experienced being hurt, maybe even by fellow Christians, or maybe you were disappointed, discouraged by circumstances, or maybe you were disillusioned, you were expecting something to happen, even a prayer to be answered and it was not, or maybe you were distracted or you were tempted by the lures of this world to veer away from God's purpose in your life. If ever you experienced any of these things in your life as you pursued God, will you raise your hand with me? You see, it's the same hands. Surprise? Not at all. Because it's all par for the course, as they say. And so, together with God's people from history, sometimes the question you and I are tempted to ask is this. So, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? You may be here this morning, and you know that you don't know Jesus personally. And so you're pursuing your own path in life. And you're hearing this discussion about pursuing God's purpose for your life. You need to listen to the answer to this question too. Everyone in this room, you and I, you and I need to have not just an answer, but the right answer to this question, is it worth it? Are you ready to discover the answer? I think you already know the answer, but I think we need to be reminded. We need to be refreshed. How many of you here are familiar with professional 
Olympic Wrestling or Mixed Martial Arts, MMA. Okay, so many of you are familiar. So in this legitimate sport, when you are ready to say, I give up, my opponent has won, I have lost, what do you do? You tap out, correctly. That's right, you tap out. That's to say, taluna, I give up, my opponent has won. Our message this morning is don't tap out, max out. Tell your seatmate, don't tap out. You max out. Max out your life for Jesus. Don't give up. It is worth it. No matter what you and I face, it will be worth it. Let me tell you, speaking of mixed martial arts and not tapping out, let me tell you about this guy. His name is Rene Martinez. His nickname is Level. I, I venture to guess how that became his nickname. Maybe he'll level you in the ring. But anyway, this guy, for 22 years, he was heading one of the most notorious gangs in Miami. It was called the Latin Syndicate. And so he and his thugs, his goons, were involved in things like uh, breaking into homes and stealing and gun running and drive-by shootings and street fighting and all of these, you know, of course, drugs and all of these violent, deep, dark uh, practices. Now, at one point in René Martinez's life, he, he had a daughter that was born to him, and he kind of thought, well, maybe I need to fix up my life a little bit. So he got into professional mixed martial arts, which is, as I said, a legitimate sport, very popular today. And obviously, his uh, being a thug on the streets helped him to become a very successful martial, uh, mixed martial arts uh, athlete. And so he became very successful, but his life still felt as empty as it felt even from years back. One day, somebody had the guts to invite René Martinez to church. Now, I ask you, how do you invite somebody like this guy who's never been to church? How do you do that? Maybe you say, hey, René, hey, Level, you want to go to church with me? <laughs> but he went, and he heard the message. And God touched his heart, and he went forward. And he was clenching his teeth, and he was clenching his fists as he went forward because he wanted to weep, and he had never, ever cried in his life. Now, that day was a turning point, but of course, his coming to Jesus and growing in Him, it was a process, just like for many of us in this room. Now, what he realized was this. His mother, many years ago when he was still a baby, she was into witchcraft. She dedicated René, her son, to Satan. And they had this lavish ceremony with, you know, blood and all of these things. But years after, his mother became a follower of Jesus. And she had been praying for her son, the thug, the goon, known as Level Martinez. And eventually, he came to know Jesus. And this man, today, he's not tapping out for Jesus. He may have tapped out of his previous life, but he's not tapping out for Jesus because he's now going back and sharing the gospel and baptizing people like gang members, prostitutes, drug dealers, prisoners, and God is using him in amazing, amazing ways. What do you say, people of God? What's our message today? Don't tap out. If you're not familiar with that term, now you learn something new. Don't tap out. If you see a fellow Christian down in the dumps, in the doldrums, tell him, tell her, don't tap out. Max out. It is worth it. It will be worth it. 
So, where did we say we would go? Acts 21. We're not there yet. Now we will be there. When we had parted from them, by the way, this, this verb, had parted, this is not like, okay, you know, goodbye. This is like they tore themselves from each other. That's how difficult it was for them to part. It says, when we had parted from them and had set sail, we ran a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. The, the writer of the book of Acts, Dr. Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, is an amazing person. Being a medical doctor, I suppose this was one of the reasons why he was so attentive to detail. So attentive to detail. And these were important even today, as we'll see in just a moment. So, very attentive to detail in Tagalog OC. Is that Tagalog? No, it's not. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean, right? Okay. So, look at what he said next. Uh, when we came in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. Why are these details in the first three verses of Acts chapter 21? Why? It reveals the intentionality of Paul. How come? Well, let's look at the map. This is where they were. See? Uh, from to Kos and to Rhodes and to Patara. If they had continued the way they were doing, riding probably a small boat, they'll probably have to stop over and over again along the coastline for so many, 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 many days before Paul would actually get to Jerusalem. Now remember, Paul's objective was to be where? In Jerusalem. Why? Because he had a financial gift for the Christians who were struggling in Jerusalem. But he didn't just want to get to Jerusalem. He said he wanted to be there, if possible, by Pentecost. Why? Because of his intentionality because he wanted to make sure that he had as large an audience as possible, believing the Lord will give him a chance to share his testimony and share the gospel. Because there will be so many Jews coming from out of town into Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And so Paul, rather than, you know, just kind of taking the long scenic route, he found a boat, much larger obviously, and they set a straight sail passing Cyprus on their left, and eventually landed in Tyre. So all of these details in God's Word, they have importance. So we shouldn't just gloss over them uh, as we might do often. When they landed, it says, after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days. Now, looking up the disciples, remember, there was no telephone directory. They could not Google, oh, uh, TCF, the Tyree Christian Fellowship. Where is that? No such thing. There was no welcoming committee on the docks for Paul and his company. You know, many years ago, I would have the privilege once in a while of riding our private company plane. Oh, diba bonga. Company plane. King Air, 11-seater, amazing. You know where the seats face each other and you can have a conference while you're flying? And so, especially when we'd have the president with us and a couple of other executives and we'd travel to certain places around the country visiting our sales offices there. And inevitably, when we would land on the tarmac and we would uh, get off the plane, especially if we had the president with us, there would be a welcoming committee there with like the sales managers and so on with a very long... Uh, well, they, they didn't have tarpaulin yet, but you know, like a banner or a streamer saying, welcome to President XYZ and other delegates from company ABC. It was amazing. But there was no such thing for the Apostle Paul. And so they had to search out these people. And that's how intentional they were. How come? Well, let me just now begin to give you an insight. At least one of the reasons why Paul was so intentional in seeking out the people of God everywhere he went. You and I know that his heart was to encourage them, to strengthen them. 
But I also believe he was very much inspired himself as he came into contact with God's people. For example, why do I say that? If you go back to Acts 11, you ask yourself, how come there were Christians in Phoenicia and the, the Tyre, which is what the capital of that? Well, it said in verse, uh, chapter 11, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen. Do you remember that? Many, many chapters ago, right? Now, who was responsible for the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen? It was Saul, right? And then unbeknownst to him, the, unex the inexplicable happened. He became a follower of Jesus. And now for the first time, we realize, it says here, uh, those that uh, were scattered, it says, made their way to where? To Phoenicia. That's where Paul was now. Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, speaking the word to, one, to no one except to Jews alone. So perhaps for the first time ever, Paul meets these people who were scattered because of the persecution that he started. Do you get what might be going on in his mind? How humbled he must have been to realize, Lord, there I was at the height of my darkness and my venom and my evil against you and your people. And in spite of myself, you used me so that today, years later, I can be face to face and call them my brothers. Ah, man, if that doesn't lift you, I don't know. And I believe the Apostle Paul was so able and so eager to impart inspiration to these people because I believe he drew inspiration from them also. And I believe every time Paul came into contact with God's people, his conclusion is, no matter what I face, it is worth it. I will not tap out. I will max out. And that's why you and I need to get together and help bring other people into the family of God. We see that in the example of the Apostle Paul. Look at our vision oh, for a change. This is now our vision not our mission, okay, for a change. What does it say? Can we read it together? To see a movement of millions of committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ meeting in small groups and transforming lives, families, communities, and nations for the glory of God. Oh, what is the main verb? <laughs> Just joking. Just joking. But here's the point. First, I want to make it very clear. CCF does not transform lives. Amen? Are we clear? CCF does not transform lives. Who alone transforms lives? Jesus. That's why it is all for Christ. It's all about Jesus. But you and I, we have the privilege of seeing lives transform. Our own, the lives of other people. Let me put it this way. What if Senator Manny Pacquiao announced that he was going to have another boxing match, okay? And he singled you out, and he sent you an airplane ticket to Las Vegas, business class. And then he got you a hotel room suite and then, of course, he gave you tickets to MGM where the fight was going to be held. Now, assuming you like boxing. I know not all of you like. Just pretend, okay? And then when you walk, when you land, you know, after a nice business class flight, maybe the first ever in your life, you walk into your hotel room suite, and you're excited to get into the, you know, the, the place where the event will be held. And when you go up to the usher, they say, oh, sir, these are awesome seats. And let's say this is the boxing ring. And the usher brings you in, and your seat is right here on the front row. Okay, are you tracking with me? What kind of seat is that called? Those of you who remember your Araneta Coliseum days. 
It's called ringside. Correct? Or let's say, okay, but I'm not into boxing. I don't identify. Fine. Who is your favorite singer? Tell me. Wala. Okay. So let me give you an answer. Barbara Streisand. But she's kind of our favorite, right? So if you belong to my, you know what I'm saying, you can choose somebody else, whoever, right? So, so imagine that person. So you get a ticket from the singer himself or herself sent to you, and you get into arena or areneta, and, and the, the, the usher says, oh, man, where did you get this ticket? And they bring you, and this is where you're seated. That's called a ringside seat. Our Lord Jesus gives you and me a ringside seat to the transformation of people. And on this earth, there are few greater blessings and privileges from God compared to seeing people's lives transform. Do you agree? When you see the life of your spouse, the lives of your children, the lives of your friends, the lives of maybe even strangers that you met, but you shared the gospel with them. As we see God work, it's like, oh, dear God, what did I do to deserve such a privilege of seeing your work in these people's lives? And the answer is nothing. It's all by grace. So let's go back to our text. Verse 4. Same verses earlier. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. So not all of their conversations apparently were pleasant and edifying. As a matter of fact, here, kept telling. In the original language means they took turns over and over and over again. They took turns one by one telling Paul, Paul, please do not pursue your plan of going to Jerusalem. Apparently, the Holy Spirit had revealed to them that indeed Paul would face a lot of dangers, a lot of trials if he goes to Jerusalem. That's nothing new. Paul already knew that. Now, I need to tell you that there are some people who actually think Paul disobeyed God by going to Jerusalem. There are some people who actually think he made a mistake. But I'd like to show you, and this is not the main point of the message, okay? And I don't want to debate this uh, lengthily. But we're going to look at some verses which clearly tell us Paul did not disobey God. He's not the type who would disobey God. We've seen his life so far, and we'll see even more of it. I just want you to know that there are those who think that he did not do the right thing. But I totally, humbly disagree, and we will see why. For example, there were times when the Holy Spirit clearly prevented Paul from going to certain places, and he did not insist. He obeyed. For example, in chapter 16, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Okay, if God closes a door here, He'll open a door somewhere else. No problem. Lord, it's all about you. But if you look at the heart of Paul, and this is something he said in last week's episode. He said, and now behold, bound by the Spirit, by the way, how many Holy Spirits are there? Of course, only one, right? So there can be no conflict. Bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem. Paul, in his, some of his epistles, referred to himself as a bond servant of Christ. The historical background is this. A bond servant is a slave who, although technically could already be set free or had the freedom to choose whatever kind of life he would live, that slave, 
of his own choice, tells his master, Master, I realize I'm better off with you than seeking my fortune elsewhere, and so I decide that I will be your slave for the rest of my life. And that's why Paul would say, Paul, a bond servant of Christ. And here he says, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, wherever I go, it's the same message over and over again, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. I already know that, Paul said. But why did he keep going? Of course, it was God's mission for him. But remember what I told you about how in the same way he wanted to impart encouragement to God's people, he knew he was also going to be on the receiving end of that inspiration. Look at what he told the Christians in Rome. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established, meaning your faith may be made more firm. And then in verse 12 he says, that is, clarifying, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. How many of you are members of a small group? I pray that as you meet, you will encourage one another. You will love one another. You will forgive one another. You will support one another. You will listen to each other's stories. You will not judge one another. You will be accountable to one another. You will be open and transparent and humble towards one another because that is how we inspire and encourage one another. As we tell of God's faithfulness, as we tell even of our failures and how God helps us get up again, it fuels our passion for Jesus. Let me tell you there is one, I mean, I just love meeting people and hearing God's story in their lives. One particular group of people I truly am blessed to spend time with once upon a, uh, once upon a time, once in a while, <laughs> are these young people, young people like the ones in this picture. You see, CCF has what we call a school of student movement. And this is where very young people go to be trained to be campus missionaries. And I am so amazed at the conviction of these young people. Once in a while they say, can you come to the class and can you teach or speak? And sometimes I do, sometimes I'm unable, but I, I always want to say, can I at least have lunch with you folks? Can we just at least share the table together? And, and tell me how you came to Christ. Tell me why you are even considering becoming a campus missionary. And of course they also ask me questions and stuff and so it's back and forth. But for me personally, I am so just lifted up by these young people. Because here are young men and women in their late teens, their early, their mid-twenties. They are willing to let worldly ambition die so that the purpose of God may live in their lives. And I tell you, I don't know how much I'm able to encourage them but I can tell you how much they encourage me. So if you're a young person in the house today, you go make some noise right now. Young people in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you think you're young but you're not, God bless you. You know, um, we will live forever anyway in heaven, right? So that's fine. Okay. Uh, let's go back to our passage. When our days there were ended, we left and started on our journey while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. Wives and children, indeed, discipleship in the family is a priority. It was even back then. Escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. Once more, I believe this was a very difficult goodbye. Because you and I know that when Paul, once Paul set foot in Jerusalem, if you read ahead, which you're welcome to do, 
and courage to do, you and I know he will be living the life of a prisoner for the rest of his life, for almost all the rest of his life. And here we see the bond that God creates among his children. It is so precious. It is so tight. It is supernatural. I know many of you here, you belong to a small group. Tell me if you've experienced this. It is hard saying goodbye when your small group is over, right? I know we've experienced this over many years in our very tiny house. So let's say you're at the dinner table. That's where you're discussing, praying, and you say, Lord, thank you for this night. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, bless us as we go home in Jesus' name. You think people will go home right away? No. Okay, so there's, it's like stations of the cross, you know? So dinner table, goodbye, okay. Uh, oh, wait, let's go to the kitchen because we have take home. Okay, so rewind from the dinner table to the kitchen. Okay, oh, can I have some? Okay, fine, no problem. And then go back to the dinner table and say, oh, wait, I forgot something. Can we pray for my mother because she's sick? Okay, sit down again. So pray for the mother. Okay, okay goodbye. We'll see you next time. The next station is the living room. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Uh, oh, by the way, what, what do you want us to bring next week? Oh, a donut? No, that's not good for the health. Something else. Oh, what do you want? Anyway, the next station is the garage. Oh, look, it's uh, what, what, uh, you know, how nice the breeze outside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the, uh, the next station is on the street. Okay, uh, so what time is next week? Oh, who, who will do the reminding? And then the next station is when they're inside the car, and when you finally say goodbye. It's hard to let go of people you love, even if you know you'll see them in a week or two, or in heaven, whichever comes first. But such is the bond that God gives His people. But you and I need to exercise that bond so that people will know that indeed we are disciples of Jesus. That's why in Hebrews we're reminded, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How many of you believe the day is drawing near that Jesus will come back? Hallelujah. Don't waste time. Encourage one another. The best is yet to come. Let's go back to our, our text. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them. How long? For a day. Paul, come on, give yourself a break. Counting sightseeing naman dyan. Send us a selfie, you know? But not Paul. Every day was precious. Every day he was on mission. And you know how much he loved God's people, how he loved to encourage people. Just the same kind of intentionality as he had in sharing Jesus with people who didn't know him. Look at what he said to the Thessalonians. But we, not just him, but the people with him, he says, but we prove to be gentle among you as a what? A nursing mother. Not just a mother, a nursing mother biologically, scientifically proven to be the, the most intimate bonding time between a mother and her child, a nursing mother, tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Folks, when we get together to encourage one another, we give each other our own lives without reservation or purpose of evasion. Because you had become very dear to us. Do you see the heart of Paul? Because whenever he sees God's people, he knows God is reminding him, Paul, it is worth it. It is worth it. There is rejoicing in heaven over how many? Over one sinner who repents. Heaven throws a party. It's amazing, the economy of Jesus. It's so different. But wait, there's more. Again, he says, you are witnesses, and so is God. Same people. He's saying, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you, believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a what? As a father. Being a model, 
being an exhorter, an encourager, as a father would his own children. You can see the heart of Paul, his passion for God's people. And no wonder he was so passionate about his mission, which was to be God's instruments for bringing more people into God's family. Do you remember a man named Jim Elliot? Who remembers Jim Elliot in this audience today? I would think very few. Jim Elliot was a young missionary many years ago. He and his friends had a burden for, uh, I guess you might call a tribal jungle minority in Ecuador many, many years ago. And he has, and his friends were beginning to make contact with those people, very secluded, uh, and they started to make contact so that they could share the gospel with them. And in one of their earlier trips, Jim and I believe four of his friends made contact face to face, and they were killed by the people they wanted to share Jesus with. Jim was the first to be killed. He was 29 years old. He maxed out for Jesus. He didn't tap out. And his death and the death of the others ushered in a time of great enthusiasm to reach these people. More people actually came, including Jim's wife and the wives of the others. And by God's grace, these people were one for Jesus Christ. And Jim Elliot said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. And if you believe you're alive today because of the will of God, of course, that's obviously true. This is the day the Lord has made, and you and I are always on mission. Let me tell you about a young man, one of our D group leaders. This is not him. This is just a, a, like a symbolic picture. He is a D group leader in one of our international satellites somewhere here in Asia. And one day, he was in a restaurant. And in the restaurant, there were two waiters who approached him. And amazingly, these two waiters were trying to convert him into their religion, which is a very popular, very fast-growing religion all over the world, which happens to be, I think I can objectively say, not friendly to Christianity. That, that would be an understatement. And so these two waiters were trying to convert him. And so our small group leader abroad, he listened, and he befriended them, and he learned something. These two guys, you know, they were also from another country who were working in that country where our D group leader was. He learned that their greatest heart's desire was to learn English. So obviously their English was What's uh, Baroque in English? Baroque. Oh, the there's an English word, Baroque, music. <laughs> anyway, so he learned they wanted to learn English. And he said, I will teach you English. I will make time for you. I will teach you English. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and they played sports together and stuff, and they became really good friends, and he taught them English. And guess what was the textbook? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so he taught them English using the Bible. And you know what I'm going to say next, right? Both of these guys came to Jesus. They gave their lives to Christ. But, yeah, go ahead. But wait, there's more. One of the waiters went back to his dorm and to his roommate and shared with him about Jesus. The roommate beat him up but he did not retaliate. Soon enough, the roommate gave his life to Jesus. The other waiter, save your applause, wait, 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 wait. The other waiter told our D group leader, I'm burdened. I want to go back to my home country. I want to share Jesus with my family. He says, you know what's going to happen. You're going to be disowned by your family the moment you do that. And he says, it's okay. I want them to know Jesus. They want to max out their lives for Jesus. Oh, now give the Lord the clap of him. <laughs> Amazing. So, folks, don't tap out. 
max out. Let's go back. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. Caesarea is like the entry point to Jerusalem. That's like where people land and then they make their way up to Jerusalem. And entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Do you remember this guy? Philip. Remember God said, there was a problem with food distribution, Acts chapter 6. God said, choose seven men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to be waiters for the congregation. And one of them was Philip, and the other, of course, was, remember, Stephen. And just imagine the drama of this meeting. Paul gets to meet Philip, the evangelist, who's one of the seven. How in the world did Philip get to where he was? This is like a couple of decades after the scattering, the persecution. How in the world did Philip get there? And then, by the way, it says, now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. So, how did he get there? So, remember the scattering, correct? Now, Philip is the same guy who uh, was sharing the gospel all over the place, and God told him, go down to the, the road, you know, the Gaza road that goes south. It's an empty place, and that's where he's, he shared the gospel and baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. And the, the reason why Philip was where he you know, went all over the place, again, is because of the persecution that Saul started. And now, for the first time, imagine the drama of the moment. Philip and Paul meet. Imagine that. And Philip says to Paul, Stephen was my friend. And Paul says, Philip, I'm so sorry for what I did. Will you forgive me? And Philip says, of course, Paul, you are my brother. And so they embrace and they weep together. So amazed at the gracious work of God to bring these two together after so many years. And then Paul is so thrilled to learn that not only is Philip still maxing out for Jesus, now even his family is serving God. Yes, he has four virgin daughters who were prophetesses, and we won't get into what that exactly means. The point is they were exercising their giftedness by God. Let me tell you about a man named Joseph. Joseph is from CCF. He and his wife became followers of Jesus many years ago when they were invited to Bible study. They discipled their children. They started a small group. Joseph, once upon a time, was actually overseeing our ushering or host ministry here in CCF, Maine. Now, at the age of 45, Joseph suffered a heart attack. At the height of his career, you know, at the zenith of his, of his uh, profession, and family life and ministry life, he had a heart attack at the age of 45. And so we go back to that question we started with. Is it worth it? Lord, why? Why this? Why now? I'm pursuing your purpose for my life. So is it worth it? If you ask Joseph, what do you think he will say? Of course it is. Because by the grace of God, he has made a full recovery. He and his wife are serving in the ministry in one of our satellites. Two, his two daughters are worship leaders here in CCF, Maine, and his son is a volunteer in the live production team. Because that's how God works when he transforms people's lives. So the message today, don't tap out, max out. So our last few verses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Okay? Same message, Holy Spirit. Notice, the Holy Spirit didn't say don't go. The Holy Spirit only said, this is what's going to happen. And Agabus had a fairly good track record as a prophet. Go back a few, not a few, 
mid ten chapters back, one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine, which happened in 46 AD, by the way, all over the world, and this took place in the reign of Claudius. That's why they could actually mark the year from uh, extra-biblical sources. And this is why the Christians in Jerusalem were suffering because of the famine, and this is why Paul was bringing a financial gift to him. It all ties in. But one of the reasons why you and I know Paul was following the will of Jesus is this. If you go further back, two chapters, this was when Saul had just met Jesus on the Damascus Road. He was blind, blinded, and he was praying, and God told this man named Ananias, early days believer, go to Saul, and he said, Lord, I don't want to do that. He's bad news. No, you don't understand. I've done something in his life. And so the Lord said to Ananias, go for he, Paul, uh, Saul, soon to become Paul, is a chosen instrument, instrument of mine to, be, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Now, fast forward to where we are now, ch chapter 21. Let me ask you, has Saul already had the opportunity to declare the gospel to the Jews? Yes, and he's not done yet. Has he been able to declare the gospel to the Gentiles? Yes, and he's not done yet. Whoops! What's this? Well, folks, amazingly, in God's sovereign plan, in chapter 24, he will share his testimony with Governor Felix, chapter 25, Governor Festus, and chapter 26 with King Agrippa. God had Paul's life all figured out. And can I just… Are you the type of person, like, when you're reading a mystery novel, an exciting novel, you cannot wait to look at the end, so you kind of… You cheat, and then you look like… So who really was the perpetrator, <laughs> you know? Can I just show you the last two verses of the book of Acts? Just to show you how sovereign God is, how, how amazing He is when we just follow His purpose for our lives. Here are the last two verses of the book. He, that's Paul. Remember, the re one of the reasons people say, you know, maybe he shouldn't have gone to Jerusalem. By that time, he was in chains and the rest of his life, most of it was like uh, as a prisoner except for a short time that he was let out. But look at the sovereignty of God. In verses 30 and 31, it says, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. He didn't have to go anywhere. People came to him. Preaching the kingdom of God, teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all what? Openness unhindered. Is God amazing or what? You know what this reminds me of? For as long as God has something for you and me to do on this earth, we are indestructible. For as long as God still has something for you and me to do on this earth, we are indestructible. But the moment it's done, we go home. And that's why Paul said, for me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When we had heard this, as well as the local resident, ah, sorry, when we had heard this, we, as well as the local residents, began begging him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now even Dr. Luke was doing it. Pronoun is we. So he joined in the chorus. Paul, come on, one last time, don't go. Don't be a fool, or I don't know what, what else they said to him, okay? Begging him not to go. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Meaning to say, guys, if you really love me, this is just my words, okay? If you really love me, don't make it so hard for me. You know this is what God wants me to do. I know. I love you. I cannot bear to leave you. But I need to do what God wants me to do. And I'm ready. It's not easy. It's difficult beyond description. But God has made me ready. One of my favorite characters or uh, personalities, rather, from the American Civil War is a general named Stonewall Jackson. Actually, that's not his real first name, but that's how they named him 
because of his tremendous courage. He was known to stand erect in, in spite of, you know, a hail of bullets coming because, well, let him explain to you. This is what he said. My religious belief, he was a committed follower of Christ, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God knows the time for my death. I do not concern myself about that, but to be always ready, no matter where it may overtake me. That is the way all men should live, and then all would be equally brave. Let me tell you as we close about a young lady named Jing. Jing is from CCF, well, anyway, I'll tell you the story. Jing was diagnosed with cancer stage 4 in 2011. And because of that, she was no longer able to go to work. She had no source of income. The Lord provided for her through the kindness of fellow believers. She had innumerable hospital confinements, chemotherapy, etc. And she actually served alongside my wife in a ministry that helps or ministers to cancer patients and their families, among others. Jing died around five years ago. She maxed out for Jesus. Let me just tell you a few things she told my wife in the course of co-ministering with her. These are approximate quotations. Jing said, I don't need to be healed to be joyful. I should not envy people who are miraculously healed by God. I should be happy for them. My wife asked her, what keeps you going? And Jing said, I will be fully healed when I see Jesus face to face. I will be fully healed when I am in His presence forever. But while I am on this earth with the strength He gives me and whatever time He gives me on earth, I want to serve Him. Jing had an eternal perspective, just like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord. What did the Apostle Paul mean by you are my joy and my crown? Look at what he said to the Thessalonians. This was his eternal perspective. He was anticipating seeing Jesus. He said, For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at His coming? You, my brothers, my sisters, whom God has transformed, you are our glory and joy. What does it mean to max out for Jesus? To max out for Jesus means to keep on pursuing God's purpose for your life, to keep on trusting God through your trials, to keep on praying for your loved ones and friends no matter how they turn your, their backs on the gospel, to keep on sharing the gospel to people, to keep on discipling your family, to keep discipling other people, to keep guarding your heart, your walk, your testimony, to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, to keep being accountable, not to live a double life. And in summary, just to keep loving Jesus and love people. The last verse of our passage today is this. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking the will of the Lord be done. It says they fell silent. I can imagine it was like a sigh. Ah, the will of the Lord be done. But Paul once said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And once upon a time, Jesus said something very similar. And he said this for your sake and for mine. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus didn't tap out. Aren't you glad? He maxed out for you and for me. Shall we bow our heads together? If you're here this morning and you are tempted to tap out, or maybe you might think, just take a break from the Christian life. Do my own thing. Be not deceived, my brother, my sister. 
because in the Christian life there is nothing to regret. It is worth it. But if you're here this morning and you know that you have not yet even taken the first step in your journey with Jesus, meaning you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior, will you just quietly and humbly pray to Him from your heart and tell Him, Lord Jesus, I want to belong to You. I want to know You. I want to be able to say that You are my Lord and my Savior. And so this morning, I open my heart and give my life to you. I repent of all the foolish things I've done. I confess my need for your forgiveness. And I give myself completely to you. Will you come and live within me? Transform me to become who you want me to be. To become even an instrument of helping people know you as I pray you will allow me to know you in days and years to come. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. As we know, he thanks you for the life of your son Jesus as we do this morning. Help us, Lord, to cling to you no matter what, believing that we will see your grace, your help, your blessing in the land of the living and on top of that, we know the best is yet to come. Dismiss us with your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name and all your people said, Amen and Amen. God bless us all.